Welcome back into the Radiopedia reading room for a podcast unconcerned with books or poetry, tea leaves or palmistry. This is a radiology podcast. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me, he's constantly striving for validation and approval. It's my co-host Frank Gaylard. <laughs> yes, that's me. My life is one long convoluted attempt at being called a good boy. <laughs> Is that actually true? Do you reckon that's your strongest motivator? God, no. No, in fact, quite the opposite, I think. Probably to a fault. The opposite as in, you're a bad boy, Frank. You haven't prepared <laughs> for the podcast again. You must do better next time. So is, that is that what you mean? I'll try and do better next time, Master <laughs> Dixon. <laughs> it reminds me, I was actually walking the dog yesterday um, and she was off the lead in the park. No, no barn me involved this time though. And uh, I noticed that if I wanted her to come back, I needed to employ like two separate strategies. So if she was moving away and I first needed to make her stop, I needed to say, Pearl, you know, you're in trouble kind of voice. Yeah. But then once she was looking at me, so once she stopped and then she's looking back at me, in order to actually get her to come all the way back to me, I needed to switch to being positive. So I needed to be yep. like, good girl, come here. But if I said, Pearl, and then she looked back at me and stopped, and then I said, come here right now, she would just like, there's no way she was coming back. Yeah, so. no, absolutely. You can learn a lot about yourself, like your reactions, and uh, as well as others by looking at how dogs respond and how you treat the dog. But yeah, yeah it makes absolute sense. Like yelling at a dog in an aggressive voice is not the way to get a dog to come towards you. The dog will back away. Absolutely. <laughs> And it's not necessarily the content of the voice, right? It's just the tone that yeah. you're using that she's responding to. And I could see her like veering away from me at one point. And then you're like, good girl. And she's like, oh, yes, I am coming towards him. Good. And then she just continues along. You know, I think that idea of the tone of your voice rather than the content is probably true for some of the lectures that we've attended. Mm. You sit there and you think, oh, this person knows what they're talking about. But if you actually try and work it out, there's no content there at all. It's just a very <laughs> thoughtful sounding voice. <laughs> Like you on the podcast, guy. <laughs> Swedish chef like. <laughs> uh, and by the way, I don't think any of this kind of psychology works on my children. <laughs> but they no. have they have been doing chores because of school holidays. Hmm. And we've got like a fifty cents per task. And I've never seen the dishwasher packed and unpacked so many times, Gaylord. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. I think they're deliberately using more plates and cups in order to put another <laughs> load on. <laughs> this is one of those unintended consequences yeah, yeah, stories. Gaming it. Like the um what's the famous one? The one about the the cobra heads in, in a city in India. Do you know that story? I think I vaguely. When it was under the British, I think they said, Oh, you know, having all these snakes in the city is terrible, so we're gonna start paying for, for the heads of these snakes. And it worked great. The first week there were like a thousand <laughs> snakes. The second week, there were like 5,000 snakes. The third week, there were like 10,000 snakes. So it's like, where are all these snakes coming from? And <laughs> there's just as many snakes in the city. And of course, it was that people were breeding them. Yeah. <laughs> so then they canceled the program. And so people just let the snakes out. And the result was there were far more snakes at the end of it than when they started. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's exactly what's happening at my house. Lots of 50 cent loads being done. <laughs> Anyway, speaking of training desired behaviours with penalties oh, yes. and rewards, Gayla, today's main segment is about AI. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to listen to the audio from a recent lecture that Dr. Hugh Harvey gave at Radiopedia 2024 on the regulation of radiology AI. Mm -hmm. So Hugh trained as a radiologist and then moved away from clinical practice and into industry, ultimately founding a consulting company that advises AI companies on how to go about obtaining regulatory approval for their medical devices. And he's based in the UK, but what he covers in this lecture applies to the EU and the US regulations, as well as many other jurisdictions around the world. And I will say this, Gaylord, that mm. one of the nice things about running a virtual conference without any vendor sponsorship at all is that we can focus our AI session more on the safety and practicalities of AI, like in this lecture, rather than overhyped presentations about specific applications oh. that you see at other conferences. Yes, God, yes. I'm sure we're going to have uh, a lot to rant about in the outro about this. But yeah. um, before we do listen to Hugh, I have everyone's favourite niche topic update, a fake meat update. 
Ah, a good boy. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. For those who are not aware, and for reasons that I'm not sure even Gaylard remembers, uh, he periodically talks about fake meat on the podcast and keeps us up to date. Yeah, I I actually don't remember exactly how this started. But, you know, I am interested in the idea of fake meat, or more precisely, meat that does not require the slaughter of sentient creatures to be a thing. Uh, But so far, the ones that I've tried, I haven't been that impressed by. They're not terrible, but they're not great. And they're more expensive than Mm. real meat. And it's really hard to change habits. But I read something just recently that sounded really interesting. One of the reasons fake meat, and we're talking here about like mints that you make burgers out of particularly, and plant-based meat substitutes don't taste quite right, is apparently the fats that are used in there. Mm. The protein component is okay. Adding heme gives it that meaty red blood kind Mm. of taste but the fat is problematic. And um, here's what the co-founder of Hoxton Farms, Mac Jamily Jamily, said in an article recently, which uh, I'll link to in the show notes. And actually you should check out the website of hoxtonfarms.com because it's pretty funny and uh, they've even got merch. But anyway. (laughs) (laughs) What, like men's T-shirts that say... Not all my meat is fake. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a bacon T-shirt. Their merch isn't amazing, but the website overall is pretty good. They've got a really good fat vibe to it. Typography, <laughs> logo, it's pretty playful. Oh, okay. Anyway, yeah. Max says, without fat, it's impossible to recreate the experience of eating traditional meat, which is what people crave for in particular. It's what flexitarians crave. Do you know what a flexitarian is, Dixon? Uh, not sure. I think I might have dated one once. She was very flexible. <laughs> oh, God, Dixon. <laughs> okay. I think that's my innuendo quota done for an episode. You know, at some point, I know you're younger than me, but at yeah. some point you just have to accept the fact that you're too old to make those jokes <laughs> and it goes into creepy territory. <laughs> yeah, and, until podcast has its own human resources department, I'll probably... <laughs> Continue to get away with it. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Max goes on to say, um, it starts with a handful of stem cells that we borrow from an animal. I like the borrowing. Yeah, yeah. Like a cow or a pig. Liposuction, maybe. Good cow, let me borrow your stem cells. (laughs) (laughs) The cells are natural precursors to fat. So if we left them in the pig, they would have turned into fat anyway. All that we do is bring them into our facility put them in a cultivator and convince them that they're still in a pig. So they develop into the same kind of fat. So they have these big stainless steel bioreactors growing animal lipid cells. Mm. And I think this is actually genius uh, because you're not dealing with any weird, highly processed soy or coconut product that humans have never eaten and that we don't know the long-term effects of. There's no deforestation to grow these crocs Uh, and if you've ever cooked potatoes in duck fat then you know how amazing food can taste i'm not surprised that the fat is important i mean the whole idea Mm. of wagyu beef is that the fat component is what is giving the texture and the flavor that and this seems like so much easier to grow fat cells than to grow muscles that have all the texture so maybe Mm. this is a, a stepping stone to truly vat grown meat Anyway, is it is it bad though that I prefer not to think about these things? <laughs> even even though this seems like a step in the right direction, every time I hear about, you know, new fake meat technology, it just reminds me that I'm currently doing something that's ethically dubious and yeah. I feel guilty. Well, I don't like think a it's bad dubious. a bad boy. <laughs> you are a bad boy, Dixon. <laughs> I also worry that once you develop vat grown tasty fat, maybe the actual real meat producers will then start feeding this fat back to their pigs and cows. And so you ultimately <laughs> you could have like tadakan flavoured beef or something because they're fed the fat of a tadakan <laughs> to their beef. Am I taking it too far? <laughs> yes, probably. But, you know, I think the approach is right. Meat's so ingrained into our culture. To shift people to become vegetarians hasn't worked. I mean, there's lots of vegetarians, but it's still a, a fraction of the population. And getting people to change what they want to eat 
it's really hard. So I think mm. if you're going to make this work, you need products that taste like real meat in the mouth and also preparing it. I think that's important because that gooey fake meat stuff, after you've handled it, you don't really want to eat it. Um, mm. Still, I picture like the future of meat production to be these skyscrapers filled with fat bioreactors covered in solar panels yeah. taking up little room and just pumping out gallons of suet lard and duck fat <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm imagining i'm imagining we should get to the main section of today's <laughs> podcast eventually dixon eventually. <laughs> but thank you thank you for bringing uh, a meat update along uh, so hugh's lecture frank did include slides when he recorded it, but I think it works uh, just as well in audio form. So he focuses his discussion on two main audiences, so radiologists or radiographers who may be assessing radiology AI products for purchase, and then also developers or clinicians who may be in the process of developing their own AI algorithm and who are looking to understand how product regulation works around the world. That's all I need to say up top, Gaylord. So let's listen in now to Dr. Hugh Harvey and then bad boy Frank and I will be back <laughs> for another chat in the outro. Hello, welcome to probably the most important and interesting session of the entire conference, which is AI regulations for radiology and medical imaging. I'm Dr. Hugh Harvey. I used to be a radiologist and I left to go to work in industry. And I have helped over 100 companies get regulatory approval around the world for various medical devices, the vast majority of which are radiology AI devices. So in this talk, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what the regulatory frameworks are with a main focus on the two major jurisdictions, EU and America. I'm going to try and relate that to what that might mean to you, either as a radiologist or a radiographer in practice, and what takeaways you can learn to go and either develop your own AI or when you're thinking about purchasing AI. So the number one question I get asked all the time is, is this thing that I'm developing or thinking about buying a medical device or not? And the answer is never really that clear cut. There are three broad categories. Either you're definitely not a medical device or you definitely are a medical device. And sometimes there's a gray zone. And with new technology, new capabilities, sometimes developers stray from that non-medical device area into a gray zone and then into the medical device area. For example, large language models are largely in the gray zone, especially around medical transcription or automated summarization, which is a point of contention currently amongst regulators. But for the vast majority of radiology AI devices, these are things that are decision support tools. They interact in the PAC system and provide either triage notifications or they like a region of interest for you to look at. Those are clinical decision support tools and they're definitely medical devices. So what are the pertinent regulatory frameworks around the world? First of all, we need to look at the two main frameworks, which are the EU and the USA. In the EU, we have the Medical Device Regulation, MDR, which only came into force in 2021. We've got the new EU AI Act as well, uh, which covers all medical devices, and I'll touch on that briefly later. And for data protection and cybersecurity, we also have the European GDPR. In America, everything is regulated by the FDA under the 21st Century Cures Act, and their data protection and cybersecurity regulations are under HIPAA. And they sometimes have statewide data protection and cybersecurity laws, such as the CCPA in California. I'll briefly mention the UK, because that's obviously where I am, as you can tell by my accent. Um, we are governed by the Medicines and Medical Devices Act, so the UK MDL, and we have basically the equivalent of European GDPR. There are others. South Korea have their own. Australia has its own, Canada, etc. But largely, everyone is aligned to, to either of these two main regulatory systems. So how do we know what is a medical device? So this is the key commonality across all regulatory jurisdictions. It really depends on the intended use of the device. So a medical device can mean any piece of hardware or software or appliance and apparatus, but for our purposes, it's software because it's AI. And it's intended by the manufacturer to be used for a number of key things. These are diagnosis, prevention, monitoring, prediction, prognosis, treatment, or alleviation of disease, or an injury or disability. Of note, in the European Union, that doesn't include animals, but in the in America, it does include animals. 
just in case any vets are watching. So what is the intended use? It's, it's a short statement, can be two or three sentences long, at the very start of any description about a device that says what the device is intended to be used for. And it's a required item in, in, in your technical documentation. And it gives a general description of what your device does, including several key factors. Who it's intended to be used by, on what conditions, on what severity of conditions, any patient selection criteria, any contraindications for use, any warnings, and a very brief description of the principal operation of the device. And then a logical explanation of why it is qualified as a medical device and which risk classification it is. So it's a very important um, statement and one that often gets overlooked. There are some additional considerations for the intended use for software medical devices, which include AI because software can also provide means and suggestions for mitigation of a disease. So that might be a system which says, you know, I found in the EMR these records, therefore I suggest that you book them in for having their blood pressure monitored, for instance. That suggestion for mitigation of a disease, and that would count as a medical device. But also specifically to radiology, the, the intended use can be to aid in diagnosis or screening or monitoring or make a prognosis prediction or determination of a physiological status. That's basically what radiologists do as, as a day-to-day -day job. So any AI intended to do any of that uh, would be regulated as, as a medical device as per its intended use. But not all use cases are as risky as each other. Um, in general, there are four categories of medical device, class one, 2A, 2B, and class three. In America, they only have three classifications, one, two, and three. But uh, in Europe and in the rest of the world, including Australia, South Korea, they have uh, these four. Class one is kind of the lowest risk where there's very little regulatory scrutiny. In fact, they don't even have to undergo an audit or produce clinical evidence. Um, by and large, it's extremely difficult to get AI software into a class one risk classification. Class two is much more common. It provides information used to take decisions with a diagnosis um, or a therapy, or it's just monitoring a physiological process. However, if the condition is severe or can lead to a deterioration in health or possibly for something like surgical intervention, it could be class 2B. Or similarly, if it's a very vital physiological process, it could be class 2B. And for the high-risk devices, that's when the decision impact uh, of the AI system could cause death or irreversible deterioration. So obviously that's much higher risk and that's class 3. How do you determine which risk classification you're in? Well, you look at the uh, International Medical Device uh, risk classification table, which splits it into two categories, the significance of the information provided by the medical device software and the state of the situation or patient condition in healthcare terms. So essentially, you want to have a very high impact device that can deal with very high impact critical situations. If you want that, you're going to be class three to class two, potentially. If you just want to inform management for low risk clinical decisions, you could be class 2A. And what's the difference? Well, there's, you, there's differences in the amount of evidence you have to present. There's differences in the amount of technical documentation you have to present. And there's differences in the post-market surveillance that you have to conduct afterwards. So obviously, a class three device requires more pre-market evidence and more post-market evidence than a lower risk class two device. By and large, the vast majority of radiology AI systems that you're seeing injectable into packs are class 2A, unless they're dealing with cancers, in which in which case they're likely to be class 2B. I'm not aware of any class 3 AI software currently on the market. So what does that mean for you as a, as a clinical practitioner? Make sure that you really understand the in indication for use, the intended use of a specific device. Um, are you looking for triage and prioritization? Or do you want something to actually pull out and detect things in images? Or do you want them to make a diagnosis? And the terms for these are CAD-T, cad -E, and CAD-X. The FDA likes to use these terms. We don't see them so much in the European regulatory uh, frameworks. By and large, most AI devices on market are either CAD-T or CAD-E or a combination of both. You really need to understand the accuracy of the AI and the patient safety risks. Both uh, humans and AI can undergo both types of clinical errors, type one and type two, but they do them in different ways. And if the AI has been adequately assessed and adequately documented, you should be able to pull out uh, what the false positives and false negative rates are of the AI system. And never forget about the data protection and cybersecurity risks. Um, you are handling patient data with a clinical AI system, 
and it is obviously illegal to let that data leak or to sell it or to misuse it or even to conduct a full automated diagnosis without a clinician in the loop in the vast majority of, of global jurisdictions. So it's really important that you focus on those aspects of the device as well. You can always ask a manufacturer of a medical device for what they mean by foreseeable misuse. So, so these are instances when they would say you shouldn't be using the device. An example is using a stroke triage tool as a diagnostic system. It is only intended to be triaging that, to be showing a prioritized list of CT scans to a radiologist or, or, or a neurosurgeon. It is not saying there is definitely a stroke. That's a foreseeable misuse to rely on the output of that triage system as a diagnostic system. So make sure you understand the limitations of use and what would count as foreseeable misuse. Under the um, regulatory paradigm in America, they've actually codified different use cases under different product codes. We don't have that in the rest of the world. Only America has this. And it's super important to understand the difference between these codes. And this is an entire lecture on its own. So I'm only going to put this, this couple of slides on it. But essentially, you need to understand that some FDA cleared AI systems are only cleared to do certain things. So some are only cleared to triage, some are only cleared to provide measurements, some are only cleared to, to provide computer assisted, computer assisted diagnosis, like characterizing lesions, especially for cancer. And some are only cleared for non-cancerous lesions, similarly. So it's very important you understand the FDA code that you are being sold or aiming to develop yourself. So what if you're developing AI? What, what does all of this mean? Obviously, you have to write a clear and unambiguous intended use statement using these seven or eight key, um, uh, key performance parameters. What is the medical indication? Who are the patients, etc., And include your reasonably foreseeable receives. And then you build your software and write, write a robust clinical evaluation plan. And clinical evaluation is broken down into three um, key steps in regulatory terms. The first is scientific validity. So is there evidence that what you're doing is valid? Can an AI system even be considered to be able to be competent at doing the task that you are aiming to achieve? And you demonstrate scientific validity by doing a systematic literature review. So you can always ask a vendor to see their literature review because you want to ensure that there's valid scientific validity backing up the science of what their technology does. Once you've proven that there's a valid association, then you can do analytical validity. Does the software actually work as it's meant to in a controlled setting? So this is kind of taking a retrospective data set, running the algorithm and making sure that it can produce performance metrics that hopefully have been identified through a scientific literature review and either meet or surpass those performance terms. And the third one is clinical validity. Is the software safe when deployed in a real world clinical setting? And that is different to analytical validity because real world data is messy, pathways are messy, and um, integrating with other IT systems is messy. If you can show that you can do all of those, then you've shown clinical validity. So if you're developing an AI system, you will need to produce something called a clinical evaluation report. And so you need to follow that process from conceptualization, scientific validity, analytical validity, clinical validity, and then Post-market, vendors need to conduct post-market surveillance and clinical follow-up. So surveillance is monitoring the market for adverse events of your device or other devices. Post-market clinical follow-up is doing meaningful audit and assessment of the performance of your device and measuring that and reporting it back. And all of that information forms a clinical evaluation report. And again, as a buyer of an AI system, you should be able to ask a vendor for their clinical evaluation report. They've drawn it up, they've submitted it to regulators. There's no reason why they shouldn't show it to you as a buyer. Some companies may choose to produce a model fact label. Um, I like this idea. If you open up a packet of drugs, there's a white piece of paper that comes out of the packet and folds out. I think all AI systems should also have this. I would like to see this on software vendors' websites as well, though it's not currently mandatory under the regulations. But this should give you all of the facts that you need, including the intended uses we've described, the performance metrics, any warnings, any contraindications, any foreseeable misuse, and anything related to IT integration that might be useful. So have a look out for this kind of model facts label. And if you're developing AI, it's a really good idea to try and, and produce one of these at the end of your at the end of your work. So how do you actually buy an AI system that's regulatory approved? The first thing to do is actually 
by an AI system that's solving a problem that you have and then deciding is AI actually the right solution. We see so often that people just want to buy AI because it's AI and that's not the right way to go about things. You want to buy an AI system because it's actually going to be useful and actually going to solve a problem. You want to check if the product meets the regulatory standards and you want to check that the product performs in line with the manufacturer's claims. So that's why you should check regulatory databases to make sure they have the certifications that they claim to have, or even ask the vendor or manufacturer to send you their regulatory clear certificates. And then you want to see their claims, either from peer review literature or from their clinical evaluation report. And once you've purchased uh, an AI system, you really need to take care to operate it just within the intended use of, your, of the AI device. You have to understand the performance limitations. People often get disappointed when they buy an AI system and they notice that it sometimes still makes errors. But that is absolutely expected because no one is claiming that an AI system is 100% accurate. So you have to be able to say to yourselves, right, I'm going to buy an AI system. Let's say it's 99% accurate. How am I going to spot it when it's wrong 1% of the time? And how are we going to work around that as a human-led team with an AI decision support? It's really important also to understand the data protection aspects of use. Increasingly, we're seeing cybersecurity attacks on healthcare systems. So do work with your IT departments and hospitals to make sure that any deployment meets all of the cybersecurity standards. And again, and I can't stress this enough, ask about foreseeable misuse and make sure you're using the device as intended. You wouldn't use a drug off-label necessarily. Why would you use an AI system off-label necessarily? So going back to the developers, there's a concept of regulatory readiness levels or RRLs. When you're developing a system, you have to think about it in terms of regulatory readiness. Where are you in this journey? And if you're not sure, get external help to, to help you do that. We often get asked um, what studies to conduct to demonstrate performance. And again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the analytical validity and clinical validity. Largely, BIOS only accepts the clinical validity data. They don't care if you've done it on a retrospective data set. They want to see that it works prospectively in the real world. So let's just think of an example of a chest X-ray AI system that might be deployed in, in accident emergency. You just should follow basic scientific principles. Many of you will have heard of the PICO framework, Population Intervention Control Comparator and Outcome. And just follow that framework as a simple guide to what kind of study or evidence that you would want to see. Largely, the population is fairly easy to understand, but that should match the intended use of the device, i.e. adults, not children, or adults of a certain age range. Um, the intervention is obviously the AI tool, and the control comparator should be radiologists as a ground truth. Not a single radiologist, because we all know radiologists on their own can get things wrong, but hopefully a consensus of radiologists as the ground truth. And typically that's done with a crossover design. And then you want to measure multiple outcomes. So the AI on its own is a good thing to measure, Radiologists on their own and with AI are two good things to measure. Um, and then you can measure other things such as the time to report or some more complex measures to measure cost savings down the line. So the clinical context is, is, is needed for more complex measures. Um, but in essence, this is the very simple framework that we recommend people follow. So what about post-market surveillance and follow-up? This should always be aligned with the regulation. Companies need to have a data collection plan um, for how they're going to surveil not the performance of the device, but technical issues, bugs, feedback, and adverse events, not just for their device, but devices of a similar nature. So for instance, if you have an FDA clear device under a single product code, you should really be surveilling all other devices under that product code for other technical issues and bugs because they could affect your system um, and you might not be aware of them. So that's surveillance. Then you have to have clinical follow-up and you should agree with the clinical partner sites for example, monthly sampling um, on a set of images, and you can conduct formal review and audit. If you aren't doing post-market clinical follow-up, you are not compliant with the regulations. And you can be taken off market. And I've seen it happen where regulators who have done a repeat follow-up audit three to five years after the initial clearance, they've asked to see clinical follow-up data, and it's not available. So it's super important, both as a developer and as a purchaser of AI, to understand the need to do clinical follow-up in a kind of audit fashion. One of the things about regulation currently is that fixed algorithms only are allowed on markets, but obviously AI can perform best when it is iterated upon and updated. So there needs to be a formal plan for implementing changes based on your post-market surveillance. 
but also there's a new regulatory paradigm not yet in force called predetermined change control plans, whereby data aggregated across sites, performance data, can be used to retrain or tweak algorithm uh, performance thresholds and then update. So do have a think about how you would like to develop a process and a quality assurance process to iterate on your algorithm and improve the performance over time. So what are the key takeaways from today's talk? Um, intended use, intended use, intended use, and on the back of that, strong scientific and clinical evidence. Regulators want to see just as much clinical evidence as clinical buyers and commissioners. And although you're not mandated to publish the clinical evidence that you generate to get your regulatory approval, it's always recommended for transparency. Regulation doesn't just encompass uh, the patient safety and device efficacy, it also covers cybersecurity. That's super important to remember. And meeting regulatory and clinical standards also aligns with delivering really solid patient level and population level value. So regulations aren't just the, a one-stop shop, done, signed off, certified. Regulations actually cover the life cycle of an entire device. And you should always think about them in the context of a life cycle of the device and the value that's going to be derived to the patients. You can contact me, Hugh, at Hydean Health if you have any regulatory questions at all. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you to Hugh Harvey there for recording that lecture for us. Uh, I think it will be increasingly important for radiologists, Gaylar, to understand the regulation around these AI products and to know what information to ask for from vendors and how to navigate this area safely, right? Yes. I think realistically, we're rushing into using some of these products a little rashly. And we don't really know or have the experience to know how these products can fail and how to monitor or prevent these different failure modes. Do you know the story of the Therac 25? Different to Theranos, which was that <laughs> one-stop yes. blood test machine, right? That duped the investors, yes, that one. that's right. Uh, Therac 25, that was a, a radiotherapy unit, right? Yes, that's right. It was a radiotherapy unit built, I think, in the early 80s, uh, and it had a software bug that resulted in a number of patients receiving doses hundreds of times higher than what was prescribed. Yeah. I remember watching an interesting documentary on YouTube some time ago, and I'll put it in the show notes. But the interesting thing was not just about how the bug itself worked, but just how long it took to confirm that this was a problem with the software or the hardware, how many patients were exposed before the machines were taken offline, and the processes around the quality assurance that hospitals had to sort of develop to try and ensure that these sort of things didn't happen. And I think we're going to see similar issues with some of these AI platforms over the coming five to 10 years, because I don't think we have the systems in place to really monitor how these products are being used in the wild, so to speak. Absolutely. I think the post-market surveillance and the local quality assurance programs are going to need to be massive for these things. And I suspect building the initial algorithm is the easy part. It's going to be hard for small players in the AI game to do all the correct regulatory yeah. stuff. Drug companies turn a profit because they're massive, but they can still do all this regulatory stuff because it's all inbuilt. But yeah. if you're a small player and, and you've only got one AI product, then having to develop all of the systems for feedback and sending out updates and that's, it's going to be a part of the business that they didn't necessarily anticipate when they were building their AI algorithm. It's going, to be, it's going to be hard. Well, I think also the problem with that is that compared to pharmaceutical industry, the upfront costs are massive to start drug development. Mm. Whereas the startup costs for AI these days are really low. I mean, a yeah. lot of these uh, companies are using large models that have been created by others. Yeah. and tweaking them. And there's a real, or oh, quick, there's money to be made here mentality, which, and that's not suggesting that pharma, uh, pharmaceutical companies aren't there to make money, but it's not quite the uh, speculative, let's get first to market uh, mm. model that's happening in AI. Two things that I thought about when I was listening, and they're things that I've thought about a little bit before, 
The first is that I've always imagined that we'll end up with a common environment, like an app store, where radiology AI products exist and you can kind of install new AI apps on your mm-hmm. packs, wrists, remove old ones, and they're all kind of verified in terms of cybersecurity because they're on this common platform. Having, at the moment, different costly implementations of every separate AI that you want to use, it's already becoming a problem in our department and mm-hmm. it's a real disincentive to actually wanting to to get Absolutely. new things. If anything, we're tending towards getting rid of the AI products that we currently have at my yep. institution and waiting on the future where it, things are going to be easier and safer. And perhaps having a single verified AI app store, you know, will actually help with this post-market surveillance as well, right? Yeah. So it's not just going to help with the cybersecurity aspect of it. It's going to make it easier to implement, but also maybe that surveillance part of it for, for even smaller players will be built into the system. Well, I mean, some of the bigger vendors already kind of have that app store mm. mentality. I know um, Siemens does. You can download different packages and presumably they all run under their own internal regulatory. Uh, The problem is they're still individually so expensive. Yeah. And it's still hard to get them set up and going often, more than you would want if you wanted to sort of dip your toe in. The other thing is the idea of whether the radiology AI should be a decision at an institutional level to use it. So everybody in the department starts using this. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a personal use decision so the radiologist decides Mm. to use it so for example i could decide as a radiologist to use an ai product to help with my x-ray reports while others in the hospital will decide not to or i may use app x for detecting cervical fractures whereas another radiologist at my hospital may prefer to use you know app y for the same task yeah you're just using it to augment your job as a radiologist, you're still taking ultimate responsibility for what you write in your report. And so therefore, it doesn't matter which one I'm using compared to another person. It's whatever one I want to use that I feel augments my reports and behavior better. But I guess the, the problem with that is the quality assurance locally, being able to test it on your own population really is, mm. is much harder. If it's just you as an individual doing it, you're never going to get that kind of feedback Yeah, that's true. And one extension of this is, should there be a requirement or is there a requirement for radiologists to disclose the use of AI (laughs) if they used it to help write their report or make a diagnosis? So currently at our hospital, for example, we have like a PE detection software, but we don't mention that in our reports, right? If, If it did flag a PE and then we report a PE, we don't say, oh, by the way, we use this to assist us in finding it. But maybe we should because... You know, maybe that is influencing our judgment on the case and we might not have found the PE otherwise or maybe we're overcalling yeah. because the AI told us. So, you know, but where do you draw the line? Many diagnoses I make, I made because I saw a similar case in a journal or I looked up Radiopedia and saw something. Yes, right. So do we go, hey, I'm making this diagnosis because I saw similar yeah. cases on Radiopedia? I think in some ways it's not so much about disclosing it to the public, although I think there is greater appetite for that to occur. Mm. Uh, I think it's about documenting the tools used during the process. That is probably what's lacking and what's required for QA. Because a lot of the AI products, when they get rolled out, when you then do QA, either it's within the product itself where you get quizzed as to, you know, did you find anything that you would have missed kind of thing. Mm. But often it's you're looking at the end result over the course of a year when the product is made available, but you don't know how often it's actually used depending on the kind of product and how easily it is to track whether it's used or not. Mm. And so really you almost need a uh, ingredients list to your radiology report. Mm. And it's like, this report was generated. I used this product. I used this other product for the report and I looked up, you know, this other thing. Yeah, um, yeah. How you do that in a way that doesn't take more time. Yeah, is it would need to be really an automated difficult. way, having yeah. a camera observing what you did. Yeah, you need you an were... AI system to do that. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing that I wanted to bring up, though, and it sort of links into this, is that I think we are seeing finally the start of disillusionment with the overhype of AI and uncovering some of the dangers. I've seen a number of papers starting to come out that are more critical, 
And in a recent uh, radiology article, um, this one's by Thomas Dratch et al., titled Automation Bias in Mammography, the Impact of Artificial Intelligence BIRAD's Suggestions on Reader Performance. Uh, what they did is quite clever. They first showed some cases with AI-suggested BIRADS uh, classification that was correct, okay. and then they showed the same radiologists uh, some cases where some of the cases had deliberately wrong AI advice. Uh, yeah. And what? Uh, guess what they showed? I mean, there's no <laughs> big surprise here. A bias. And here's the conclusion. <laughs> this this sums it up. The results show that inexperienced, moderately experienced and very experienced radiologists reading mammograms are prone to automation bias when being supported by an AI-based system. That sounds like every radiologist. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Exactly. This and other effects of human and machine interaction must be considered to ensure safe deployment and accurate diagnostic performance when combining human readers and AI. And to me, this is really the problem because... There is a gold rush mentality at the moment with so many vendors and startups wanting to be first to market with their shiny Mm. AI product. And they are, contrary to what you see on their websites, primarily interested in making a ton of cash and doing so before others get there, right? And they can only really justify the price tag in one of two ways. And you'll have seen it in your own department. Either their product can result in a more accurate diagnosis or interpretation, or B, their product can make radiologists more efficient. And uh, you can bet which of those two, accurate diagnosis or efficiency in the current economic climate, uh, which of those two is the more attractive uh, business case proposition for a hospital. Exactly. And so those two things, better diagnosis overall and efficiency are kind of actually at odds with each other. Because if you want to avoid the kind of problems shown in this paper, then you actually need to add friction to the process. Uh, Whereas by definition, that's going to make you slower, but that actually undermines the business case of saving radiologists time and therefore money. And so a lot of these systems are designed to make you take their advice and move on to the next report as easy as possible. And we're setting ourselves up for some pretty bad outcomes, I think, because I don't believe most of the validation studies out there. I don't think that when radiologists are doing it honestly as part of a validation study, that that maps exactly to what it's like when it's in the wild. And I think we're going to see a number of papers over the next years coming out showing that actually some of these products not only didn't work as advertised, but were believed and that our performance might have got faster, but at the expense of accuracy. Mm. I think it's a very, very astute observation, Gaylard. Good boy. (laughs) Good boy. It always comes back to motivations and rewards. And if the reward is faster turnaround time, greater dollars in the corporate account, and that's going to win out just... Just like the naughty dog at the park. We've come full circle, Gaylord, so it must be time to wrap up (laughs) this episode. How can people get in contact with us? Well, more importantly, we don't really check Twitter anymore, but you can definitely email us at podcast at radiopedia.org. So you're saying we should change our little document here so it doesn't doesn't say anything about Twitter first. Yeah, that's right. Podcast at radiopedia.org email. That's probably the best way to give us any ideas and feedbacks. There was actually a nice extended AI panel at the conference, Frank, that I was tempted to play as the main segment today, but I thought it might be good to get the people involved in that panel to actually join us um, Mm, for a similar discussion on the podcast. Um, So if people enjoy the topic of AI, then perhaps let us know and I'll work towards a future episode. That sounds like a very good idea, Dixon. And if you want to help support Radiopedia, then you can become a paid supporter via the website or purchase an all-access pass to our online courses and conference. In doing so, you'll be helping us to give free course and conference access to people in 125 low- and middle-income countries. And and what else can people do to help us out, Frank? You can also help us out by leaving a five-star review in the podcast app of your choosing. Absolutely. And also let people know. Word of mouth yes, is, probably, is probably the number one thing, actually. So if yeah. you're enjoying listening to the podcast and you think others will enjoy it as well, then um, let them know. Hopefully we can build the community 
even more. Uh, we've been promoting the community over on the website. So if you go to radiopedia.org slash community, uh, you can join our chat, um, which is uh, becoming more and more active every day, which is great. Yep. Uh, we're also increasing some of the messaging we're putting out on Messenger and WhatsApp and what's the other one called, Gaylard? Instagram. Instagram, that's the, that's one. the one. That's so, the one all the kids uh, are So if you're on. using any of those <laughs> ones, then then check out that as well. And we'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room. Stay right, everyone. Stay right. See you next time, Dixon. <laughs> Good boy, Frankie. Good boy. <laughs> My tail's wagging. You can't see it. <laughs> you didn't tell us about the flexitarian in the end. Oh, no, I forgot. I got so distracted by your dirty old man comment. <laughs> <laughs> We save it for a future episode, or are you? Oh, gonna... if you want. No one's listening now. Anyway, I might as well tell you. Oh, yeah. The music doesn't go this long. Flexitarian. What's a flexitarian? It's it's like a omnivore person that eats everything, but that tends to focus on vegetables and only occasionally eats meat. So that's actually probably a reasonable description of what I would be if I didn't yeah. have a child that was almost entirely carnivore. <laughs> yeah. It makes it hard when you're serving dinner oh, and you need to have. Geez. A meat end of the table and a non-meat end. Yeah. All right. See you again in a couple of weeks. See you later, Dixon. Bye-bye. Bye.